Good morning, everyone. I am uh, really humbled to be here because I see a lot of legends of CAD. Uh, I have seen uh, Mike Payne somewhere. I'm not sure where he is. He's right there. Uh, he is the person who hired me in 98. So if you are going to listen to me for half an hour, a boring presentation, it's his fault. <laughs> OK, so I'm here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is moving from delivering products to delivering experiences. And you know, it's already happening. Earlier this year, I talked to Mr. Hao Wu, who is the CEO of ExoVolar, and look at what he's trying to do. By the looks of it, what he's trying to do is he's trying to create a jet suit. So I asked him, in his own words, can you tell us what you're trying to do? Listen to him carefully. And of course, you cannot hear the sound. Oh, yes, you can. The experience of to experience of what flying feels like, you know, without extensive training, you don't have to train, you don't have to, you know, worry about your safety because it's tethered inside, but you can fly freely. The question that you have to ask yourself is, how many times did you hear the word jet suit in his explanation? Not even once. He's not delivering jet suit. He's delivering an experience. Flying like a superhero is the experience that he wants to deliver. Now, let's witness the first-hand experience what Mr. Howe felt when he did it for the first time. So you know, this is the expression that can only be led by an experience. <laughs> Will you agree? This is what our clients want their users to feel when they deliver their products. To deliver beyond functional value. Now I'm going to give you some background so that I can set the right context. As you know, DASA Systems, we are uh, game changers in three different sectors, manufacturing, medical, life sciences and healthcare, as well as uh, cities, infrastructure, and territories. And SolidWorks as a brand plays in all these three. We have 11 different industries, or we should say we serve 11 different industries with 12 different brands. Each brand has a unique position, and SolidWorks is uniquely positioned to serve the design segment. And I'm the CEO of SolidWorks, you know. But despite that, I would say that design alone is not enough anymore. And let me tell you a personal story to prove the fact. I, am, I have two beautiful daughters. They are wearing my shirts to go to an event. Uh, the older one, she was always a finicky eater. Now, if you know any Indian friend, all Indian kids are finicky eaters, so nothing big, no big deal. She was a special one. You might miss a flight, and she will not finish her food. And we used to get really frustrated that, what, what the heck is wrong with you? And then she turned 12. And like every American dad, I had to take her to an orthodontist appointment. Now, believe me, um, in US, you may have any amount of flaws, but your teeth has to be perfect. Your smile has to be perfect. <laughs> so every father, the day you have a kid born, you have to save $5,000, because each kid costs you $5,000 for orthodontist appointment. So, I say that, and all American guys, you know that, right? I'm not kidding. <laughs> I never had that, but I think my smile is good enough. But thankfully, when we took her, they took a 3D scan, and we realized that there was a problem. Now, if you look at that picture carefully, her upper teeth is behind her lower jaw. And if you try to feel it inside your mouth, most often your upper teeth is in front of your lower jaw. That's how you bite. That was not the case with her. And if you look at the 3D scan, which was shown to us, it was a total mishmash. On the back side, her teeth was OK. On the front side, it was not OK. So essentially, it was not that she was not chewing fast. She could not chew fast. The poor girl, she was doing the, her, her best. And when we realized that, the orthodontist said that, you know, wait for a couple of years, because in a few years, nature a lot of time fixes things by itself. So we waited for a few years. Then when she was about 14 years old, 
she came home after one of her visits with mom, and she came home crying. It's like, what happened? This is what happened. They said that since nature has not fixed the problem by itself, now we have to give you two options. One option is that we are going to cut your upper jaw, move it slightly forward, rotate it, or the plan B is we do the same on upper jaw and do a different kind of operation on the lower jaw to move it backwards. And of course, as a 14-year-old, she was scared. My wife was scared. I was the only one who was trying to put a brave face. I was scared, to be frank. But I put a brave face. It's OK. It's just a surgery, right? We were given plan A, plan B. Now you are all professionals. A lot of you are engineers, PhDs, and so on. Which plan should you go for? Exactly. I was having the same exact feeling. That, what the heck? Then. The beauty was that they also gave us three, uh, the uh, renderings based on the, on the jaw position. They gave us three different renderings. So this is what she will look like today. Uh, she, uh, she was before operation. Option A and option B is what you might look like. Of course, there is no guarantee. But this might be how you, your daughter might look like. And based on this, my daughter was able to figure out what she wanted. She went with that option. Now, while all this is happening, we are glad that we are based in Boston, because Boston has one of the best children's hospitals. But it also means that the bookings are well in advance. If you have a critical situation, you can walk into Boston Children's. But if you do not have a critical condition, this was not a critical condition, you have to book, book in years in advance. Plus, when this surgery happens, you can imagine that your entire jaw is get, kind of getting split apart. You are not allowed to chew for a couple of weeks six weeks to be, to be precise. You can only drink liquid diet. I was to make sure that I was not traveling. So I had to make sure that my, uh, this thing coincides with French holidays, because that's the only time when I don't travel. Uh, now, and the school vacations as well, because July is school vacation. End of August is when school starts. So we had to plan this in advance with doctor's availability and so on. And when she decided which plan she wants to go with, there was a precise splint design for her. It was not a generic splint. There was a precise hardware. Because you, you can imagine when jaws are broken apart, you have to place it with hardware. That precise hardware was done with her scan. Even three, four years back, it, it used to be generic hardware. And once, you, once doctors have, are in surgery room, they are also trying to sort of uh, move things apart and so on. No, no more. It's all precise. There was a precise bill of material created. Now, after this, she went through the surgery. Everything went fine. Uh, there was a six weeks of uh, me trying to feed her liquid diet. So when a lot of people ask me, that, what did you do during summer this year? I perfected my skills of smoothie making. I can serve you any kind of smoothies. <laughs> but my daughter also got a better experience for her life. So if I see what was the end delivery, end delivery was a better experience for her entire life. I hope you agree. Now, why am, why am I telling you this story? Let me try to convert it into ingenious world. There was a problem. There was underbite. Someone needed to create a design in order to fix that problem. Then someone needed to give us multiple options to give, to give me. Because if there was only one option given to me, I would not have known, was it the best possible option? Or there were, there were better choices. So the doctor gave us multiple options. Just looking at that option was not enough. I needed to have visual results in order to determine that whether, which option is the best one. Manufacturing was precise for her. It was not a generic thing. It was a personalized manufacturing. And ultimately, everything was governed for years. There was a delivery date which was defined two years in advance. And then everything was converged with that delivery date. So it had to be governed in a very precise way. And why am I telling you all this? Because this is exactly what we are doing with 3D Experience Works. 3D Experience Works, with 3D Experience Works, what we have done is we have exposed not only SOLIDWORKS applications, SOLIDWORKS roles. Rather, we have hand-picked roles coming from all different brands of SOLIDWORKS. And we have served our SOLIDWORKS users with those needs. 
So essentially, if you hear the word SolidWorks is expanding with 3D Experience Works, it's to expand our most successful design ecosystem by providing with a powerful portfolio of solutions coming from all SolidWorks, all, all DASO system brands. It serves in all the five domains that I showed to you. And a lot of it is working from anywhere, anytime, any device. A large ecosystem of that particular portfolio is available to you from the browser. So this was the first part of my speech. The second part is that who do we want to serve it with? Or who should be creating experiences? And our claim is that everyone should be experienced creators and consumers. We are big in students' education market. We are big in uh, startups, um, makers, hobbyists, business professionals, and so on, right? Last year, what we did was we also launched 3D Experience SolidWorks for Makers for $10 a month, which is essentially two cups of coffee if it is in UK, or three if you are a Dunkin' if you if you favor Dunkin coffee in US. But essentially, it's between two to three coffee. For that price a month, you can use SolidWorks. It's full SolidWorks. There is no gimmicks. It has full capabilities. We have not taken out anything. Plus, it comes with platform. Plus, it comes with manufacturing solution and so on. It's only for ten dollars a month. Now, I started in the RC hobby at the age of twelve. I dreamed of having a model of the seventeen fly fortress. So, with my CAD tools and three D printers sitting idle in anticipation, I decided to build one. Thanks for watching, and welcome to Three D Aero Ventures. A hobbyist, if you're a maker, if you want to play with SolidWorks and its full glory, go for it. But we did not stop there. A lot of people out there are hobbyists, DIYers. And in order to serve DIYers and hobbyists, what we did, what we did was we delivered a new tool on the platform of their choice, which is mobile and tablet. In fact, our Cambridge-based team, Gordon Ori is sitting here, he leads that team. That team is the one who created this. It has lifelike behaviors. If you go in real life and try to create a, a furniture, what do you do? You go and try to use planks. You go to a hardware store to buy, plan, uh, buy planks. You do not start with a sketch in the air. You do not try to extrude things. You do not create volume out of the thin air. So this is what we are doing. And now the question is what people are able to do with this. They are able to create amazing furniture that you see in these next few videos. So this is what they have created, and they have used it in their, uh, in their homes, in the project in Home by Me. This is available for everyone for free. This is a new design paradigm. It is based on reuse of content. It is not based on creating push, sort of things from scratch. And now, last one, the future of design. Before moving for, further, uh, let's try to put certain facts uh, together. We are part of Dassault Systems, which means that the entire R&D or, or the research is at our disposal at this point with the 3D Experience Works portfolio. You may not be able to read this. It's OK. You can find this PDF online. This is the annual report of Dassault Systems for 2021. 40% of R&D employees, employees of DS are R&D, which means around 8,000 plus people are in, solid, in Dassault Systems R&D. And in 2021, we spent more than a billion dollars on R&D. So with that, what do we do? Let's, let's try to take the first thing, uh, AI, into consideration. Let me show you something really exciting. Being part of Dassault Systems, it means that we have access to technology developed by our research team, the central research team. For this demo, imagine you are a car manufacturing company. And most likely, you have done it for ages, which means you already have a lot of data already in your, um, w with you. Now the question is that how should you, and your knowledge is somehow embedded in that data, in the relationships. It's all embedded in your data, essentially. How do you extract that knowledge? This is what our research team is trying to do, to figure out how to extract that knowledge. 
Now, 3D Experience Platform makes it simple because today all your data is dispersed on all different hardware devices. If you combine all of it together on 3D Experience Platform, it gives you that kind of capability. Now, what can you do with that? With that, you will be able to say that I want to apply a template to a given new car production. When you do that, you select the axle and we'll be able to tell you that what kind of spacer is going to go with that axle. Select that spacer, we'll tell you what kind of disc brake is going to go there, what kind of sort of uh, the, the brake shoe is going to uh, clamp with it and so on, and soon enough you'll be able to design the entire car. Now, this is research. Are we delivering anything? Of course we are. So while the research is doing the bigger things, we also deliver things in X-Design already. Based on what you have done in past, if you start to create sketch entities in your sketch, will we be able to predict what you might want? Because we know what you do. We know how you have worked in your past. So here, by creating some simple sketch entities, and you ask X-Design, SolidWorks X-Design, to suggest where that entity might, by, might be needed, we are able to tell you precisely where it needs to go. If you place a hardware component on a given assembly. To place a single hardware, you have to create a coaxial constraint, then you have to create a coplanar constraint. A lot of clicks involved, right? But with a simple suggestion, we are able to replicate it 43 times without you even lifting a finger. OK, you have to lift a finger in order to click. Are we, not, are we only delivering it on X apps? Of course not, or cloud apps, I should say. Even on SolidWorks, we are trying to integrate AI. This is an example where an inspection, uh, SolidWorks inspection, you might want to load a PDF file and you may want to have an inspector look at all these annotations to say if these are okay or not. Now, as an inspector, you have to, you know what these annotations are or where these annotations are. But so should AI. So now AI is able to place balloons next to all these annotations automatically. All the, all the inspector has to do is that click on the balloon and say okay or not okay. Let's talk a about the next uh, design uh, change. Generative design. Now, you, you have uh, seen it, so I'm not going to belabor the point, uh, whether it is static load based on which you want to do generative design, whether it is the flow with which you want to generate the design automatically, whether it is a graph from which you want to create a complex pattern shape, or whether it is a sort of automatic generation of lattice to provide you with the same strength and so on. So this is, this is all good. You have seen this. So. But what about learning from the best designer out there, which is nature itself? This is what our research team is also trying to do. If you look at nature, and to prove that we are trying to use a helicopter model, and we are trying to optimize this helicopter model, to prove that, let's take one of the shapes and try to apply trabecular kind of structure. Now, trabecular is a cell that is found at the end of your bones to give you extreme strength, yet it is extremely hollow. So it is very lightweight, yet extremely strong. So can we use that kind of design learned from nature to apply to give you the most lightweight model possible? Now, the next thing is when when uh, you look at nature, in nature, a lot of times, the load is not static. The way a cheetah moves is not the way you move. And evolution has happened over billions of years, I should say, or since uh, these species evolved, where the dynamic loading condition evolves your muscles, your bones, in a certain way. So when this rotor is rotating, the load is not static. It is, it is dynamic. So can we use the dynamic loading condition in order to give the most optimal design that you may want as a designer? And last one is, this, this video is four minutes long, a lot of cool things, but I, I do have to stop at some point, so I'll, I'll stop after this one. The last one I'm going to show is where can we grow a design? In fact, even when the jaw surgery happened in my daughter's uh, case, we went back to the doctor, and when they scan the face again, you can see that the bone is already formed back. So in nature, if things split apart, the nature fixes it by growing cells around it. Can we not use that? By growing things in order to make that design. 
and then use the other enhancements that, that has already happened where we start to apply trabecular structure in order to provide you the, with the least possible weight. Now, in order to do all this, you need a lot of uh, capabilities. Of course, as SOLIDWORKS, we don't have that capability. But as DASA systems, we have that capability. Because DASA systems, is we have everything, right from design, simulation, manufacturing, even molecule design. We have BioVia as a brand which does molecule design. So we have that capability to serve you in a holistic way. So I'll stop there. The third one is modeling and simulation. Now, to prove that, let me use ExoVolar model. When ExoVolar was designing the model, there is a bracket which is holding the weight of the person and rest of the, of the jet engine. And that cannot fail. That absolutely cannot fail. Now, if you are a typical simulation modeling uh, engineer, what do you do? You take that model, you run through the simulation, the simulation will tell you some red areas, some green areas, some blue areas, so you know where you can take stuff out. Then you know where to put stuff in. So you go from modeling back to simulation. Then simulation tells you something. You go back to modeling, make changes, come back to simulation, go back to modeling, simulation. Why do you need to do all that jump? And this is where we will see a drastic change. Now, in this case, I'm just going to show you something called design of experiments. But we are working on making these two worlds be colliding together. In this particular sa sample, we took certain parameters and said, you, are, you, Mr. Software, are allowed to change these parameters and provide to me the best possible design. We go through all that pain to give you the best possible design. So essentially, modeling and simulation works, worlds are going to collide together. There will be no two different worlds. And the last one I'm going to talk to you about is sustainability. If you look at this, you might have seen this. If you have, great. Not. What you will not realize is that this is the materials required in order to build a car. So you're looking at a car. Imagine after driving a car for 10 years, when it goes back to junkyard, if that can somehow get converted to something like this, it becomes a beautiful object. Today, we see it as a junk. It's thrown away. Tomorrow, it should not be thrown away. It should be recycled. And in that regard, sustainability is a big push that we want to have in, in terms of uh, impacting society. Because you know, when you eat something today, you know how many calories you are getting in a given pack of chips. But when you use a product, do you know what was the impact on the environment? As of today, we are taking more away from the nature than we are putting back on. And this cannot last. So how does you, as a designer, get that kind of information? If I claim that soon enough, every product designer will have to provide this kind of information, you may not believe me. But I think that's going to happen. Because the world is changing extremely fast. So we are also looking at that future and building these kind of tools. Now, this is not just about providing the information about your, your carbon footprint, your environmental footprint. It's also about changing your, the ways you design. Designing by recycling objects is more difficult than taking something new from scratch. Even if you have to design simple things like this chair, if you are trying to take every single part as a new part, a new object that you can build from scratch, it's very easy. If you go to a dumpster, if you go to a junkyard, and say that from that junkyard, I'm going to create something beautiful, it's going to be more difficult. So we have to think of those consequences as well. So in short, if we have to summarize, I can keep on going forever, because uh, there are so many different things, but I have to stop at some point. If I have to summarize the future of design, I see these four things playing a big role in near future. And the key takeaways for me will be uh, there is already a transformational change going on where we need to stop thinking of delivering products and we need to start thinking about delivering experiences. Functionality is no longer enough. Experience delivery, it is essentially if, if you, uh, and who delivers these experiences? We want everyone to be creators. We do not think, we do not believe that innovation only happens in big companies or big boardrooms. Innovation should happen everywhere. And to do that, we are providing tools, the same tools that are at disposal of everyone. And the last one, 
we are predicting that the future of design is going to be created by vanishing boundaries between different disciplines, whether it is design simulation, design manufacturing, everything should converge at some point. And this is the future of design. And with that, let me invite my friend here, Kirby. Kirby Downey, he's uh, from 3D Print UK. He's a SolidWorks champion, SolidWorks user. He leads SolidWorks London user yes. groups. Uh, and you're here to talk about one of those experiences. Yeah, something that I, uh, that I like to create. Is... Awesome. So he's here to talk about the Magic Wheelchair project. So tell, tell us about Magic Wheelchair. So Magic Wheelchair is a uh, United States-based nonprofit organization that basically gets a lot of makers and builders to put together wheelchairs for kids who want to be included in stuff like cosplay, Halloween, World Book Day kind of thing. So this is something that I've also helped bring to the UK with them. But we've got a little trailer that uh, explains a bit more about Magic Wheelchair. What makes a hero? Is it that he is fast? Or that she is strong? Does a hero really need a costume? Or just a big heart? Sometimes, even heroes need a bit of help. And a little bit of magic. These are our heroes. They inspire us to do good. Magic Wheelchair. Putting a smile on the face of every child. Wow, this is amazing, Kirby. Yeah. So, what was your contribution here? So I've worked on three magic wheelchair builds so far. Um, basically a cool speeder bike, a dragon, and the one on the end is one that I'm kind of halfway through um, because of a surgery that he needed to go through. Um, but uh, an example of how many magic wheelchairs uh, that get made per year, if you go to the next image, um, this is just one year of magic wheelchairs that have been created um, all around the United States um, for various different kids with different interests. Cool. Uh, can you tell us more about the three projects that you did? So this is the first one that we built. This is originally a off-road wheelchair. Um, it's a little video, so it should be playing. It should be playing. There we go. It's that we turn into a Star Wars speeder just after the release of the Mandalorian. Um, for example, uh, Jacob, that was his first electric wheelchair, first time he was actually able to move on his own without any assistance. Um, and this thing can actually go up to 40 miles an hour <laughs> and go off-road. So... <laughs> A bit extreme, but it, it was a really fun project, and there's the old CEO of SolarWorks having some fun in it as well. Um, so yeah, it's just about making kids smile and, and, and giving them something that you know they, they won't have access to or they don't know the people that can provide it. The second one was Team George. This is the first magic wheelchair that we built outside of the United States. This was built in a, a week and a half, um, a very kind of quick, uh, fast build. and. For him, he loves going to Cos uh, Comic Con and dressing up, and he loves Ninjago and the dragons from Ninjago. So we created uh, a dragon for him, um, for him to run around and chase his, his sister in. Um, and that's the three of us that built it. Team Preston, this is the latest project that I'm working with. He has cerebral palsy, um, and he's non-verbal. So we created this little device for him that has four of his favorite songs, as well as four sayings from different member of his family and he can actually recognize the, the, the sounds and the voices and that. Because he needs to go for a hip surgery, we didn't do the magic, the wheelchair part of it, but now um, he's doing his surgery, I think, this month, um, and then after that, we're actually gonna complete the, the actual build, and you'll see the, the concept stages for, for that whole product. And uh, yeah, if you want to check out more information about the videos, there's some kiosk uh, codes, the slide will be back up a, a bit later. Okay. Um so how do you even start? Can you take us through that journey? So obviously you've got to meet up with the, with the kids, find out who they are, what they like, um, and you just have conversations with them. But you've also got to ask the right kind of questions for the family, such as what are their accessibility needs, um, what does the kid require. For example, uh, Preston here, he's uh, epileptic, so we couldn't do anything that covers him. Um, and then the next stage is actually measure up the wheelchair, make a, a rough model of it from there. And then we can actually start using design tools and concepting around that, that design. You know, we've got, to, we've got to find out what's the most important parts of the wheelchair. Um, and then, yeah, using 
design tools and SolidWorks and various different kind of maker tools to actually create our concepts and um, come up with a final product in the end there. Okay, so the next phase was what, design phase? Yes, so this is part of the design phase. For example, with this uh, wheelchair for George, I didn't need to model the actual uh, wheel. I just needed to know what was the radius of the wheel that moves around. Um, I needed to know where his feet needed to be and I needed to make sh locate the exact position of the D-clips because that's where we were clipping the dragon on. Um, we can't put too much weight on these wheelchairs. Um, they aren't really built for that. Um, and then we used other kind of uh, designers, part of the, the, the SolarWorks Champions program, to use um, SolarWorks apps to create um, these really organic shapes that we then used as a kind of a guide to make the model um, of our actual thing. So, I mean, that's the kind of concept stage of, of the actual dragon uh, for George, which is quite cool. <laughs> with the means. Dragon, okay. <laughs> Tell uh, us more about that. So, when it came to actually building it, we just used the PVC frame, EVA foam, basic cosplay techniques um, that a lot of cosplayers would use and a lot of foam and hand crafting. Everything for this was built, was made uh, over a week and a half all by hand. Um, kind of just using techniques that I learned watching YouTube. Um, everything that we learned uh, here, we can take on to the next project, but watching, watching people like, you know, don't have break, we always need one. Um, <laughs> Watching people like Adam Savage from Mythbusters and his channel Tested and other kind of prop makers, all those free resources online um, to teach you how to do this and having access to 3D printers and 3D printing bureaus like 3D Print UK and access to Maker's Edition, access to all these kind of tools. Anybody can actually get involved with this. Anybody can actually be a build team and actually make anything that they ever wanted and help use that, that knowledge to help communities and, and help out little kids which is the kind of direction that I decided to go with my design skills. I get and more out of it. Once these guys come out of, after sanding, it's almost like Ghostbuster movie. Uh, they're all white. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it was, that was a long weekend. So how about the, the dragon uh, wings themselves? Uh, yeah, so this, for this build, the dragon wings were all mechanical. Um, this is actually quite a basic structure that cosplayers use for their kind of wing structures. We needed to figure out how long each of these beams needed to be, so I made a quick mock-up model in SolidWorks, uh, created assembly and was able to test how those wings will be, how they'll work, because they need to be wide enough to look cool, but they need to compress enough so the wheelchair can still uh, go through a doorway. Um, most conventions use kind of like double doors, so that's the, the idea behind it. And then from there, we were able to cut, measure that, cut the PVC pipes of everything to the exact length, and it all worked out spectacularly, I think. So was it your first? trial that it worked or? First time. So having access to something that can you simulate and test things out really kind of helps out with that iteration process so you don't have to waste that much material. Cool. So what, what about uh, collaboration itself? Did pretty help you? So yeah, I, I, I did all the measurements of the, the wheelchairs um, and I used the SolarWorks Champions program, a lot of designers from around the world to kind of um, work with um, do, do, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? Use their skills to the best. Um, Jade's very good at children's toy design, so for Preston stuff, I got her to do all the concepts. I think there's supposed to be a video that's playing. Um, whereas Adam, I got him to do the dragon stuff. No, it's not working. Maybe. It's not interesting. Working. It's okay. um, so I used this, the SolarWorks Champions Network to kind of help that, uh, to create everything. Now it's pink. Uh, oh, yeah, the pictures. <laughs> so, I mean, Working with people, I mean, the, 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 the speeder was built, was designed in the UK, built in Canada, and revealed in the United States. So having various tools to kind of collaborate is very, very helpful. And are you under any kind of time pressure for these kind of things? Yes and no. Um, obviously, we, we run under the kid's schedule. If the kid is not well or anything like that, it gets called off. But I mean, this is five minutes before a reveal, us assembling components, because um, uh, they got lost in the mail. So. <laughs> So we used the local maker space and we used Zometry to kind of overnight parts that we then had to assemble right at the last minute. Um, and that's kind of just part of it. it you, just, you get used to it. Everybody got involved. People who weren't part of the Magic Wheelchair build were there on their hands and knees painting things and assembling things because they wanted to help and make sure that it comes out perfectly. Okay, my last and favorite question. So what did you deliver in the end? Uh, experiences. I mean, <laughs> for, for me it's an experience because I spend so much time up close to these products 
when we reveal it and we see everybody smiling, that's the first time that I get to look back and appreciate what I've done. Um, and for example, um, for him, first time he's able to move around unassisted. Um, and for, for him, that was quite exciting. We were kind of like nervous and he just went full throttle uh, through the hallways, security chasing us. And then we said, no, 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 that's an assistive device. device. You can't stop him from using it. <laughs> 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 and, and, and for George, like him and his family just hanging out in the park, chasing each other, um, having a really good time and, you know, really enjoying doing something completely different. And for Preston, for him to have a, a little device that allows him to play sounds, his mother said to me, she no longer has to give him his, her iPhone when they're out and about to play his favorite songs. She's lost multiple phones because of that and she doesn't need to do that anymore because of this little device that we created. Awesome. So if you want to see the rest of the, the full videos of the, the projects that I've actually worked on there, um, there's a QR, code, QR codes to the different videos that I've produced, them, kind of like the processes that I went through. Thank you for listening to our uh, half an hour long speech. As I said, <laughs> all blames go to Mike. Uh, all kudos comes here, right? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.